met him at uh, numerous mid-year annual conventions and the big annual conventions over the Memorial Day weekend and have enjoyed his warm friendship and his leadership. Uh, Dr. Adler is the uh, son of uh, Dr. Alfred Adler. He is the dean of the Alfred Adler Institute of New York. He's also the dean of the Advanced Institute of, Psycho of uh, Analytic Psychotherapy in New York. He's the, uh, an attending psychiatrist at Lenox Hills Hospital in New York. And uh, he has uh, authored, written many papers on various subjects, including depression and suicide. So it gives me great personal pleasure to be able to introduce to you Dr. Kurt Adler. I hope you hear me all. Can I be heard well? Yes? Thank you, Dr. Bartholo, for your very kind introduction. On this topic of depression and the treatment of it, which are and techniques of treatment, when I talk of that and when I come to the art and the technique of treatment, you have to realize that one cannot make any rules or laws or give prescriptions. So one cannot standardize the methods of treatment. And any time I stress certain approaches and aspects of technique, their application is bound to vary or differ in every case. Every case is individual. And it depends on the type of individual, his preparation for everything, his readiness, his unreadiness, and so on. In addition, the application of the treatment methods will also vary with the individual therapist. Not every therapist can use every technique with the same results. Now, in all cases of neurosis, and particularly in depression. It is most important that the therapist do his, his utmost to deflate the high value that the patient sets upon his symptoms. Patients make a big to-do about their symptoms because they suffer from it. But this deflation must be done with the greatest tact because many patients cannot endure having their symptoms devalued. They depend on the high value of their symptoms. The therapist, therefore, cannot be told how far and how quickly he can go about doing what is necessary, but he must feel his way in order to learn or sense how far he can go in exploding the symptoms. In some cases, this can be done directly, immediately, but in other cases, the therapist must go in a roundabout way. In cases of depression, as you will see, the patient exerts all his efforts to exploit his troubles and expounds them in such a way that one would think nothing like that has ever happened to anyone. Now, when I talk of depression, you must realize that we are talking of the most prevalent of all neuroses. Millions of people suffer from depression to a sufficient degree so that they are incapacitated and they are seeking treatment. Many more millions are only partially incapacitated and usually attempt self-treatment, either with drugs and very often with alcohol. And still more millions either do not know that they are depressed, possibly because 
some psychosomatic symptom, physical symptom hides their depression for them. Or they accept the state of being depressed as it being the natural state of mind for them in life. I've heard people answer when somebody comes to them and says, oh, I'm so depressed. The person says, who isn't? <laughs> Therefore, as you see, the term depression may imply just simply lowered spirits, feelings of mild dejection, the blues, an unhappy mood. On the other hand, depression can be manifested by slowing down of thinking ability, severe agitation, constant preoccupying occupying ruminations, paranoid delusions, depersonalizations, and severe physical symptoms, insomnia, weight loss, anorexia, lack of appetite, atypical pains of all sorts, severe migraines, and many other symptoms. And there are also, of course, the manic depressives, the menopausal depression, involutional depression, and the psychotic depressions. And then there is also the old and frequently still used differentiation between what they call an endogenous depression and an exogenous depression. Now, the exogenous depressions that have also been called reactive depression. These are supposed to be caused by some external event, and therefore they are supposed to be influenceable by encouragement, by psychotherapy, and they do not have this feature of self-depreciation. On the other hand, people have said and written a lot and still do, endogenous depressions have this feature of self-depreciation and are supposedly due to metabolic, endocrine, physiological changes, as well as being genetically determined and cannot be influenced by psychotherapy. All these statements you can hear and read, and many physicians hold to those, that differentiation. But both those statements are manifestly incorrect because both conditions, if there is really such a differentiation which is doubtful, can be influenced by psychotherapy. And in both cases, obvious changes of the constituents of body fluids, metabolic, endocrine, can always be found, biochemically and so on. Obviously. Because you can always and will always find such changes in any change of emotional attitudes. For instance, simply, if somebody tells somebody something and he blushes. Now, how can he blush unless there are biochemical changes, endocrine changes? Something has to go into the bloodstream to widen the vessel, vessels in order to be able to blush. But that doesn't mean that the biochemical changes cause the blushing. The blushing is caused by what the person interprets, what he has been told and what he is thinking about, not by the biochemical changes. And while I do esteem research and applaud all new findings by researchers, when they claim to have found the causes or reasons for the origin of a disease, be it depression or schizophrenia, just because they found some body fluids are different in these cases and in the non-sick cases, I find it rather naive, to say the least, and trite, because they should have expected changes. And I find it limited because I cannot see different explanations for their findings. And by the way, these self-accusation and self depreciations that have been definitely recorded in cases where, to the satisfaction of the researchers themselves, they manifestly belonged under the heading of reactive depression. In general, it must also be said that any differentiation between endogenous and reactive depression is frequently very difficult, 
especially since the external cause that is supposed to be present in the reactive depressions is often hidden to both the patient himself and the therapist. Now, in more or less careful researches of 143 cases of depression, 31 were labeled as endogenous, 61 as reactive or neurotic depressions, and 51 have been labeled as doubtful. Others doing researches have found no significant differences between the symptoms of endogenous and exogenous and doubtful cases. According to a new trend of thought, the understanding of the dynamics of depressive illness has increased recently and a the delineation, a separation of neurotic depression appears now more difficult and less meaningful. According to Usher, dynamic features of the depressive illness do not show differentiate, differentiating characteristic specific enough to permit a distinction between a neurotic and a psychotic depression. And according to Kolb, who is a who was until a few days ago the uh, New York State mental hygiene chief, there is no such difference in fundamental nature of any psychogenic disorders as to warrant the present rigid and meticulous distinction between neurosis and psychosis. This is a, a new trend that, of course, Adler has stated many, many years ago. We do, however, have to differentiate, and more or less clearly, between depression and a schizoid or schizoaffective state of hopelessness. Also, depression and hopelessness, schizoid hopelessness, can be combined and the combination of both is not rare. We talk of depression, and we are also talking of a condition that is as old as human history. Hippocrates described the symptoms of depression nearly in the same terms as they are described today. And Plutarch gave a colorful account of depression and its symptoms. And Areteus in the fourth century then wrote voluminously about it, and very much in the same way that it is described today. Now this is, disorder or illness has probably altered the course of millions of lives. And therefore it is said to have influenced human destiny. Of course, one of the most disastrous consequences and dangers is suicide. Suicide, which occurs at the rate of about 1 in 10,000 in the general population, occurs 50 times more often in the depressed, which means 1 in 200 depressed. In the past 20 years, in the United States, the suicide rate in young people, 15 to 24, has risen 250%. Now this, however, I must ascribe more to the greater tendency to escape reality, which means the schizoid hopelessness, abetted by the taking of drugs, rather than depression. It should be noted that calling a depression a neurotic depression instead of a psychotic one does not in any way diminish the danger of suicide. From depression, no profession is immune. And physicians, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers are frequently suffering from it. Also, I maintain that with adequate and successful therapy, they shouldn't. Alcohol and drugs 
are very often the remedies that these professionals grasp at in their attempt to undo their depression. About clergymen, it is legendary that they become so often afflicted with depression. And Cotton Mather wrote prolifically about his own state of depression. And to quote from a book by Kalinowski and Hippos, because of depression, favorable enterprises have been abandoned because the owner had forebodings of disaster. Of course, the pessimistic view of the depressive is very known. Important research has been neglected because the investigator imagined difficulties which are not there. Defeat has been snatched from the jaws of victory because a military commander countermanded a campaign which in reality had already succeeded. At a more mundane level, the housewife is too tired to maintain pride in herself and her home. The bright student with high potentials lacks drive to convert his assets into successful accomplishments. And still at the same level, the illness has many paradoxes. The rich man feels he's poor. The beauty begs for plastic surgery. And depressed people are swayed neither by logic nor by objective evidence. That's from Kalinowski and Hippos. Now, in the course of history, there were many attempts at an explanation of this mysterious condition. Evil body fluids, particularly black bile, was blamed for the condition. The liver, the gallbladder, the stomach were considered the seeds of the condition. And in the Middle Ages, evil spirits were held responsible and had to be exorcised, as even is today the custom in some more primitive tribes and amongst some more primitive people. Robert Burton, who lived in 1577, not only wrote about melancholia, which was the old name for depression, but actually gloried in it, feeling that it gave him life and death. He concluded that heredity, lack of affection, and sexual frustration were the causes of melancholia. You can see where Freud got that idea. And he said that jealousy, suspicion, aggression, and envy prevented melancholics from forming association with others. The Elizabethan poet Folk Greville described melancholia as, quote, this worries, wearisome condition of humanity. And he, as T. Coleridge wrote about it in this form, a grief without pang, dark and drear, a stifled, drowsy, impassioned grief which finds no natural outlet, no relief in word or sigh or tear. Now, in modern times, the difficulties with the attempts at explanations for the origin of this depression were equally great. According to his very faithful biography, Jones, Freud failed in his attempt to construct a theory of depression. Only much later, together with Abraham, they constructed a theory of depression that would fit into the, their general theory of the libido. And according to that theory, then, when a love object, not a subject, an object, was lost, they always call it an object, even if it's a human being, the libido was repressed and then reappeared in the form of depression. The final form of the psychoanalytic theory of depression was given by Rado, according to Fenichel, who wrote the fundamental book on psychoanalytic theory. And according to this theory, the libido breaks in two in its agony over the loss of the love object. I've always found that formulation very touching and poetic, like the heart breaks in two, the libido breaks in two. One part then is repressed as latent aggression, while the other part is retroflexed and turned against oneself. And then Rado also added fear of retribution as cause of self-punishment, which is a term frequently used, but actually very misleading. 
and to bring also orality into it, which is important in the psychoanalytic theory, that all depression contains a fear of starvation that originates with the infants. Now all these elaborate, symbolic, often no doubt poetic theories did not and could not explain the phenomenon of suicide in depression. Freud, as you no doubt, doubt know, had eventually to add the death instinct to his libido theory. And then he managed an internal duel between eros and thanatos, libido and death instinct, which satisfied apparently him for an explanation of suicide. Freud was enamored with explanatory concepts which he himself admitted were superbly indefinite and remote as long as they had parallels in Greek mythology. But hundreds of otherwise staunch Freudians were left out in the cold because they would not or could not accept the theory of the death instinct. And that included Rado himself, who a few years before his death declared at a meeting of the Society of Psychoanalytic Physicians, where I was, <coughs> that the phenomenon of suicide is still unexplained. In a recent study by three very interesting researchers, studying of 107 publications revealed that the largest areas of disagreement relate to the evaluation of the personality of the suicide in general and his specific motivation for suicide. Now this formulation, loss of love object in the Freud, Abraham, Rado theory of depression, has caused a lot of trouble for psychoanalysts. In a paper on the theoretical and clinical aspects of depression, for instance, three of them, Gulker, Schein, and Wender, carried this formulation to two of its logical conclusions. And they stated, if there is a loss of love object, there must have been love in order for the love object to be lost. So the ability to love is a necessary precondition for depression. For those of you who have treated depression, it may be very clear that the ability to love in these patients with depression is greatly diminished and often entirely vanquished by the rage, the fury, the hatred that the depressed has for people. Because they need to feel on top of others, need to dominate them and depreciate them, and really cannot love. For those who have not become aware of that as yet, I intend to demonstrate that fact very fully in the course of these lectures and workshops. Now the second conclusion these three made in their paper was a statement that since depression is so rarely seen in children, there must be maturity and a better integrated personality for depression to exist. That sounds nearly unbelievable to say something like that. It's saying like, for instance, echolalia, which is in schizophrenia a, a symptom where a patient will repeat what is said to him, is also a sign of maturity because infants cannot repeat words. <laughs> Besides, it's not at all true that depression is so rarely seen in children. It only manifests itself somewhat differently in children. We find depression in children and the history of depression in childhood in many of our patients. And we have the studies of René Spitz and others on the subjects that are very clearly indicating that there is depression in childhood very frequently. Paul Federn states that mania and depression are due to the inability to stand frustration, which sounds correct. He continues that while the manic seeks comfort too quickly, the depressed deviates by his inability to seek comfort at all. Now, if we are taken in by what the patient says and pretends, it may look as if the depressed were not seeking any comfort at all, 
but the depressed seeks constantly the greatest comfort, or what for him is comfort. Only he cannot possibly acknowledge getting comfort, because after all his misery, the fact that he, fate treats him badly, that people give him no real help, is a depressed's most formidable weapon in his battle to dominate his opponents, to depreciate them, to accuse them of being the cause of all of his failures and being of no help. How can he possibly admit that he's getting comfort? But even very good clinicians have gone awfully wrong when trying to explain the genesis of depression. English and Pearson, Philadelphia, write in their book that the parental attitude of letting children cry it out too often and too long is bad and the baffling lack of emotional response in depression is undoubtedly due to this cause. I like especially the term undoubtedly. Now taking the patient's own motivations more into consideration is a statement of Guttheil, a pupil of Steckel, who defined depression as sadness plus pessimism. And recognizing the depressed fear of a revelation of his own worthlessness, despite his frequent protestations and testimony to his own worthlessness when he depreciates himself. Sullivan stated there is only a superficial similarity between grief and depression, which is correct. And he sees purposeful action in the depressed suicide when he says, our impulse to live in these papers people is vanquished entirely by a hateful combination of impulses which lead to destroying oneself in order to strike at some other person. Clara Thompson, criticizing Freud's death instinct theory, recognizes also that suicide is usually stimulated by motives other than self-destruction, spite and punishing the loved one are almost invariably factors. And Carl Manager, too, confirms the revenge motive in suicide and shows what the suicide is really after when he commits suicide. And it is not self-destruction. So he quotes a poem that the suicide wrote. When the grass shall cover me head to foot where I am lying, when not any wind that blows, summer blooms, nor winter snows, shall awake me to your sighing, close above me as you pass, you will say how kind she was. You will say how true she was when the grass grows over me. I'm quoting that here, although I'll not talk specifically yet about suicide until later, because I want to show you that when you deal with people in depression, you have to deal in the realm of ego psychology, which means what the patient himself feels and does and thinks, not instinct psychology. It does of no help at all. You get up, you get to meet up with invariably with all the depressed prestige striving, his personal vanities, his petty motives, his secret and illusory goals, with what he wants to hide about himself, with what he wants to impress others with, his, what phony structures and concepts he has formulated, and what false beliefs he holds, and what false ideals he caters to. And I will go into all this specifically. But with that statement, I'm going right away into the fundamental statements on ego psychology by Adler in his personality theory. Adler states that psychological phenomena can never be understood or explained by energies, causes, instincts, impulses, by, but only by knowing a person's goal, what he is after what he wants, what he's trying to achieve. And he says, experiences, traumata, sexual development mechanisms, and so on, can never yield by themselves an explanation for anything. 
only the perspective in which these experiences, trauma, sexual development mechanism, are seen by the individual himself, his individual way of seeing them will yield an explanation. But his individual way of seeing them is subordinated to his final goal, what he's really striving to. Another way of saying this is more important for the understanding of a person than his heredity, his instinct, his disposition, his objective experiences, or his real environment. More important than all of these is his subjective evaluation of all these. An evaluation whose nature and form is dictated by his final goal, which stands in a certain, though often strange, relation to reality. And Adler said that men cannot think, will, feel, or act without the perception of some goal. To understand an individual, we have to get to know and understand his goals, therefore, his unconscious goals, his unconscious motivations, what the real purpose of his action is. And as far as neuroses are concerned, concerned, Adler stated the following, and I have to introduce it this way in order to come to the specific neurosis we are concerned with, namely depression. Adler stated that neuroses have the ultimate purpose to safeguard a, in, a person from a catastrophic clash with reality and its demands and expectations. In order that, so he hopes, the danger that his inadequacy may become revealed to himself and to others will hopefully be avoided. What appears then as different neuroses are in reality only different safeguarding devices by which he hopes he can sneak himself through life without losing the to him so important feeling of his personal value, his prestige, his significance, his superiority. Now these safeguarding devices, as Adler has called them, were later replaced when Freud introduced the term defense mechanisms. Only that originally Freud meant these only as a defense against one's own inner drives and impulses, instincts. Later, however, defense mechanisms became to mean, as a rule, the same as Adler's safeguarding devices, especially after Anna Freud in 1933 had written that in children, defense mechanisms may also defend against interpersonal threats, not only the intra personal ones. Now the specific safeguarding device or defense mechanism or symptom or neurosis that we call depression has, like all neurosis, its very special characteristics. One usually immediately obvious feature that differentiates it from most other neurosis is the fact that the goal that a neurosis is supposed to achieve in all neuroses, namely to avoid appearing insignificant and small and inferior, or to affect appearing big, important and great, here in depression is either perverted or carefully camouflaged. Because to all appearances, as you probably know, the depressed only all too often depreciates himself. He accuses himself of being a miserable creature, the greatest failure, the cause of all sorts of calamities, and a definitely hopeless case. Where is here that goal of wanting to achieve, of being superior, striving to appear significant? Now let us look, however, rather than listening to what he says and what his behavior accomplishes and what the results of it are. And what do we find? By depreciating himself, he has in reality been fishing for compliments. And usually he succeeds. You can be sure that whenever you see somebody speaking of himself as no good and weak and so on, there will somebody come in the company who will jump to his defense and tell him how good he really is. In addition, 
he has succeeded in forcing everybody around him to worry about him. He has put himself into the center of attention. He forces people around him into his service, and he will exploit those who are his willing victims ruthlessly, and those who resist and do not let themselves be exploited, he makes look mean and selfish since they refuse to help a helpless and sick person like himself. What is the total result? He is actually in the center of attention. His importance to everybody has been underlined and stressed. Everybody has to be careful not to irritate him while well, he is excused from all cooperation. He is relieved of all obligations. He has a license to do what he wants. He could hardly wish for a more privileged position to counteract his feelings of inferiority. Just one thing is perhaps missing still to complete his glorious self-image that he creates by that. How can he, with all the exploitation he perpetrates on everybody around him, with all the demands he makes on them where he does nothing, how can he appear noble and tender-hearted to boot? Usually, however, he accomplishes this easily. So he hopes and very often succeeds with a device well known to all of you. He develops, he de expresses, and he suffers from guilt feelings. He suffers from a guilt complex about exploiting everybody, about being such a burden to everybody, about making their life so miserable. And he tries to impress everybody around him how much he suffers from these guilt feelings. Now, guilt feelings. This is another area in which Freud and psychoanalysis, as well as dynamic psychiatry in general, has had a lot of trouble with. They play around with the assumed intrapsychic battles between ego, it, and superego, and they overlook completely the fact that guilt feelings do not fall from heaven that nobody can put them into a person. So if one realizes that people give guilt feelings to themselves, that they manufacture guilt feelings, it becomes quite clear that there must be a very powerful and impelling reason for them for doing so, since guilt feelings are obviously not something very pleasant to suffer from. In fact, a person must be convinced, consciously or unconsciously, that he will derive such enormous advantages from manufacturing for himself a guilt feeling that it will outweigh the pain, the misery, the mental anguish that the guilt complex produces in him. Now, like for any symptom, such a powerful and impelling reason can only be a threat of total annihilation to one's idealized self-image. To sustain that, the payment of any cost seems worthwhile to the neurotic. And what are the benefits of suffering from guilt feelings? A person who constantly wallows in guilt feelings actually accomplishes an artificial dissociation of himself, an artificial apparent splitting of himself, because he becomes, on the one hand, the miserable culprit who does all this exploiting and commits all those acts and so on. But then, on the other hand, is now the condemning judge who is absolutely against those acts, beats his breast about it, and who, of course, never could commit such acts. He feels very superior about the noble spirit in the role of such a judge, which undoes for him the to a great extent, the feelings of inferiority created by the acts committed by the miserable culprit on the other side. He also, of course, hopes that we will judge him for his noble spirit rather than for his actual actions, or that his noble spirit will at least constitute a mitigating circumstance in his favor. And while he indulges in his noble spirit, he is not actually with it. He's not where he really is. 
he has succeeded successfully removing himself from where he actually is into a spiritual realm of noble sentiments on cloud nine where no action is necessary or even possible. Where no improvement is necessary or even possible. Obviously because where you are not, from where you are not, you cannot go anywhere. Thus, he actually has paralyzed himself for any action. And you will see and find that people who have guilt feelings are the most inactive people. Now, governments and religions have known that for thousands of years. They have known that the peon who beats his breast will not be able to raise his hand against the landlord. <laughs> they have therefore tried to induce people, their subjects, to feel guilty. Now this lack of understanding of the meaning and purpose of guilt feelings is also the reason why psychoanalysis, as well as most of the rest of psychiatry, have had such miserable failure in the treatment of alcoholics. Alcoholics notoriously indulge in guilt feelings about being drunk the morning after. And half the day then, or all day then, they may indulge in condemning the drunkards they had been the night before. This is very taxing work. And fills them with all the nobility they express by it. It rightly deserves a drink by night, doesn't it? <laughs> And so the cycle repeats itself with the help of guilt feelings until they can admit, admit to themselves and to others that they are just drunkards in flesh and in spirit and are ready to work on improvement of the whole personality. Nothing can be accomplished. Now look what comparatively easy success Alcoholics Anonymous has had with them. How did they do it? First, they absolutely and finally abolished guilt feelings in them. They tell their clients right in the beginning, and this is a creed or everyone has to subscribe to, that they are born with such special tissues, with such a special body constitution, that when they have wandering, they must have a second, a third, and so on. They tell them it's your body with which you are born, it has nothing to do with your psyche, your willpower, your psychology, etc. It's not your fault. Now they cannot have guilt feelings anymore. Surrounded by equals, which is also important in their groups, they do not have to impress them with their noble spirit either. They can start working on avoiding the first drink. They are suddenly not paralyzed anymore. And the social part of Alcoholics Anonymous is then helping them to become more cooperative human beings, which is, of course, also very important. But the removal of the guilt feelings is the first step and it works only on those who accept the thesis of being born with such abnormal tissues. Now the thesis, may I tell you, is actually untrue. But as long as they believe it, it works. And this shows again the validity of ego psychology. And Adler's first book has as its motto, in Latin, omnia ex opinione suspensa sunt, which means everything depends on one's opinion of it. You can also meet up and with creating and holding on to guilt feelings, for instance, in the religious fanatics, where it is also designed to enhance their feeling of superiority. The religious fanatic may not forgive himself for his sins, even though the priest has forgiven him absolution. Now, this makes him a person with higher religious morals and scruples and higher principles than the priest. Nietzsche said already, guilt feelings are mere wickedness. And Dr. Dreykus from Chicago used to say, guilt feelings are the good intentions one does not have. <laughs> now when treating a depressed patient who complains about suffering from guilt feelings, they should be demolished without delay. I might say to him or to her, 
What do you mean? You, you feel guilty? You mean to say in your lofty spirit you condemn the very things you do? You mean you want to continue doing exactly what you are doing, don't you? Yet you want to impress the world around you that in your heart you are against it. How noble of you! I assure you people around you would be much happier if you would improve your action just a little bit and to hell with you it's high-flown noble sentiments. <laughs> Don't you see there are only eyewash? A phony halo you put undeservedly on your head? Since only you can make your guilt feelings, don't you see that you are making them for a purpose? For the purpose of looking better to yourself and to others? Can you tell me any other purpose for which you make guilt feelings? They don't help you in any way and they certainly don't help anyone else, do they? I usually don't hear anything anymore about guilt feelings. <laughs> Of course, this is concentrated somewhat. I can't tell, say to every patient that way right away. There's a story told about my father treating an adolescent who complained heavily about suffering from guilt feelings about masturbating. My father is said to have said to him, you mean to say you masturbate and feel guilty? That's too much. One of it would be enough, either masturbate or feel guilty. <laughs> is too much. Now here's the real reason for manufacturing guilt feeling in this boy was that his brother had outdone this boy in about everything. And he knew that his brother also masturbated. So there was his chance to outdo his brother in saintliness and nobility of spirit by developing, professing, and suffering from guilt feelings. Now, after this short excursion into just one of the important manifestations, frequent manifestations of depression, guilt feelings, let us return to depression per se. And in particular, let us go into the genesis of depression, how a person develops that neurosis that we call depression from childhood on. Will you tell me when I should make an intermission? Bob? Okay. Now all children from infancy on in their attempt at coping with life, in their attempt of accomplishing the necessary adaptation to life, will try to develop some mastery of their environment. They will try to overcome all the obstacles they find in their way, be it to achieve a more comfortable position first, to satisfy some hunger pain, or whatever. They will attempt it by using and testing out all possible methods that are available to them as far as their body, their capabilities, their environment, their experiences, make use of such a method possible. Such adaptation takes always place and proceeds in a constant trial and error way. A method that the child finds successful, that brings him the desired comfort, will be repeated over and over again, will be trained in this way thoroughly, will become fixed in memory, so that it becomes an automatic response. It will become this child's way of moving, of thinking, of responding, of feeling. It will become part of this child's style of life. A method that is found unsuccessful by the child will not be repeated, certainly not frequently, will not be trained, will be largely forgotten, except perhaps for remembering this method doesn't work, does not bring relief or satisfaction. Now naturally, this is not an all or none proposition, but a matter of degree. And some children will find several methods useful and workable, one more and one less. While another child may find one method so overwhelmingly successful that he will not attempt any other method. And we therefore find occasionally nearly pure neurosis, where we usually find mixed neurosis, with, for instance, depression only a part of the total neurotic picture. Now let us take then, for instance, the method of crying. That's a function that is readily available to every child. I have heard Dr. Dreikurs tell of children, normal children, that were born to deaf parents. 
And they very soon learned to cry with tears streaming down their face, but not a peep coming out of their mouth. <laughs> they have learned very soon their parents will not react to the sound of crying because they are deaf, but they will react to the vision of crying. Now this is a phenomenon that only ego psychology can explain. No instinct psychology can find an explanation for a thing like that. Some children may find crying so excellent a method for getting what they want that they will use it on every occasion and we will have a cry baby. <laughs> Even in adults, we sometimes find such people whose eyes will fill with tears at the slightest provocation, who choke up crying nearly all the time. And children who find crying so successful will hardly be willing to give it up, and so they develop it further through adolescence into ad adulthood. They do that by constantly imagining recalling, fantasizing, repeating in their mind situations from their experience, from reading, from hearing situations, happenings, that will be cause for crying. They have to become pessimists and always predict terrible things to happen to them or to others. Adler said, the discouraged child who finds he can best tyrannize with tears will become a crybaby. And the direct line of development leads from the crybaby to the adult depressed patient. This patient tries then to approximate the well-tested picture of the helpless, weak, needy child. For he discovered from personal experience that it possesses a great and most compelling force. When we look into the history of a depressed patient and his development, we will nearly always find he does not recoil from stressing and even exaggerating his weakness, his illness, his inadequacy. He has depended since childhood on the active help and assistance of others to an excessive degree. All those manifestations, such as crying, whining, pouting, moping, presenting oneself as weak, as helpless, as sick, in need of help. All these can be forerunners of the adult depressed. And you can probably see now why depression is so widespread. It is because a great majority of children in our society have experienced that at times, at least, crying, whining, pouting, pointing to one's weakness or sickness will often as a rule in some, at least sometimes in others, bring services from others. We'll get them help and assistance from others, we'll get them their way. And because these so-called passive-aggressive methods have been and still are to a large extent in our society today more acceptable in women than in men, we do find depression more frequently in women than in men. Also, depression is the most prevalent neurosis in men and women. On the other hand, since men are notoriously trained in our society still today to be more active and aggressive, while women are trained to be more passive, we find that there are more suicides in men than in women. Because the act of suicide needs a greater degree of activity. But there are more suicide attempts in women than there are in men. Now with women's lib encompassing wider and wider circles, these statistics I expect will soon change. And we soon may have an equal amount of depression and an equal amount of suicides in men and women. But when we see this passive aggressive neurosis depression, we must keep in mind that just as there is always anger, rage, and fury in the tears of the baby because of non-fulfillment of his wishes and needs and the frustration he experiences, 
There is always anger, rage and fury in the depressed adult. Depression can be recognized as an expression of extremely, com extremely competitive personality. The depressive is determined to prevail, to win, in every interpersonal encounter. For him, life is a battle with individuals and with fate. He's going to get what he wants, and he's not going to be forced to exert himself responsibly in pursuit of a more realistic goal. Those who deny him, who undermine his living techniques and cause him frustration, deprivation, anger, and anxiety, and those who press him with responsibility will be punished by him or outwitted, or both, at any cost to himself, even his sanity or his life. He will sacrifice some or all of his potentials for living, but in his subjective, distorted, competitive emotional orientation, he will nevertheless feel he is victorious. He is a victor. The anger and the rage and the fury of the depressed is very often carefully hidden <clears throat> so that the depressed himself, as well as other people, are often not aware of it. In treatment, the uncovering of this basic fury, rage, and anger is the most important first task for the therapist. Because as long as there is anger or fury that the person does not feel entitled to and fears that if he is aware of its existence, that he will expose himself as be, of being at fault for his shortcomings. This anger is turned against oneself in the form of depression, which in a way always accuses others for his failure. To uncover this basic rage and anger is not always easy, because anger and rage are often suppressed quite deeply. And the reason why these emotions are so often suppressed is that these emotions are generally considered anything but noble emotions. And the depressed always wants to be considered a noble person. He also fears he might lose the benevolence of his surroundings if his anger did become apparent, because angry people are not very lovable. He also fears he might lose that benevolence, especially anger and rage against one's parents is often considered a, a sin, in addition to the fear of losing the love of the parents. Also religiously, it is a sin. I have uh, a Jesuit priest in treatment for depression, and he cannot admit anger at his mother against whom he is furious, but he cannot admit it. So I told him, that even God has righteous wrath, why shouldn't he be permitted? It should be noted that Adler already in 1914 wrote that the depressed has a, as a rule one main, one important opponent, one antagonist with whom he battled for dominance to whom he feels he must prove his importance and significance, that he is right, and that he must and should be considered first of all, and that his will should be done. In more recent years, Arietti has found this too and has called it the significant other in the depressions. Now, how do you make a depressed patient acknowledge his fury and anger? That's not always easy. If, for instance, and I'm thinking of an actual case, a young woman denies her anger and fury against her mother, whom I have found from the history to be her significant opponent, and she has told me that her mother, even if she does not always do the right thing by her, she always means well. I ask her first if that is really enough for her. She will usually admit it's not enough, but how can she be angry at her mother, who she knows means well? Then I tell her the fable of the woodsman and the bear, who have made friendships in the woods. And the bear always watches the woodman's nap very carefully so that nothing should disturb the nap of the woodsman. One day the bear 
sees a fly setting down on the woodman's forehead. So very quietly, the bear goes and picks up a huge rock and drops it on the fly. <laughs> he meant well. <laughs> So I say, it's not enough to mean well. You must also succeed to do well. If you always don't do well, there's at least a justified suspicion that maybe you didn't think of meaning well either. <laughs> and I tell her she's amply entitled to be angry at her mother for always not succeeding to do the right thing by her. Why can't she do the right thing by her? She's usually doing quite all right by herself, isn't she? Interestingly enough, as soon as a patient feels entitled to be angry at her mother, and in fact the relationship with her mother, it is not necessary for the patient to express that anger to her mother, or to hit her over the head, of course. In fact, the relationship with the mother usually improves, even if it may get worse at first. But only for a short time, because it later improves always because the restraint and guardedness that she approaches always, already her mother against revealing anger has brought constant severe tension into the relationship. And that is then gone when she feels entitled to be angry and feels she can tell at least herself, if not even her mother, that this is not right and she's angry about it. And by the way, you may have noticed that this principle that you have to really do the right and not only mean well fits also the patient himself who pretends to have noble motives and intentions but actually exploits people shamelessly. So this may also sink in. Eventually, I would like to say that here, although it's more applicable late in the course of therapy, while it is very important to rouse the anger and fury against the parent where it is not acknowledged but there, and to make the patient feel justified to feel and have anger at first, it is also very important in the end to come eventually to the point where the mothers or fathers own upbringing by their parents. The patient's grandparents is considered as having perhaps been at least partially to blame for the horrible shortcomings the patient's parents have. Of course, the great grand generated them from nothing. Maybe they too come off from his parents. And to a patient who will protest that there is nothing good in him, as many depressed will, one might say, well, to rock recognize what is bad in his parents, in the world, in himself, this critical ability is at least maybe something he has to think, thank his parents for. <laughs> By the way, the first significant opponent of the depressed is very often also a depressed mother or father. In the course of history, the significant opponent may switch and become a husband, a wife, a boy or a girlfriend. And when you treat the depressed patient, you should watch out that you are not the next significant opponent of the depressed <laughs> that he chooses for his victim and tries to battle with. This cannot always entirely be avoided. And when it does happen, it gives the therapist a chance to demonstrate obviously and clearly how the depressed insists that he dominates the situation and everyone around him, including the therapist. I think we should make an intermission here in order to have a coffee break and then continue after a short coffee break. <laughs> I, I understand that some people in the back have not heard too well uh, with the change of set up where they have taken me off my feet. Uh, how do you hear now? Is it still not very good? What's that? What did you say? I said hearing well. Hearing well, yeah? No. Still not. Ah. 
How is it now? Can you hear better now? Is it good enough? All right. So let us begin. Now, if you have ever seen a person in a deep depression, you may wonder it's a physical picture of the depressed. But this is all due to the excessive rage and hate and fury, together with fear and anxiety, that are responsible for the physical symptoms, the dulling of the mind, with its constant preoccupation and rumination about the dire fate that expects him, the sleep disturbances, the digestive disturbances, the changes in blood pressure, the disturbance of the bowel functions, and of practically all other organs. He neglects his nourishment, the care of his body and his clothes, and presents an ashen gray face. Now with such a pitiful picture, he can now firmly establish that he is sick and nothing can be expected from him, that he is not responsible, and that he needs help and services from others. The depressed is ready to go to all lengths in order to demonstrate these facts, and he is ready to pay any cost. He can sit, for example, for hours with body agitation, while he paints in his mind the most vivid pictures of the evils that will befall him. And then he acts as if they had already befallen him. This is his method of producing an actual shock effect, a physical shock effect with the utilization of his, all his emotional potentials, fear, anxiety, and always rage against someone near his significant antagonist. In such a state, then, the endocrine substances that are released by the body in various excessive or diminished amounts produce the actual physical changes. And the agitation in the agitated depression is due to the tremendous fury that makes them shake, very much akin to those forces mobilized by the enraged and crying baby who gets blue and chokes and shakes from agitation. Many have functional capacities that they refuse to employ. Their refusal is not open. They do not openly refuse to use their capabilities. It takes the form of retardation, hopelessness, seeming helplessness, sometimes seductive or even hypomanic enlistment of others. Their dependency, however, is not genuine, although they are very dependent. It is always a form of demand. They exploit the generosity and responsibility of others or at times they exploit another's fear of appearing unconcerned. Now this connection between anger and depression is comparatively new in psychiatry and psychology. But artists, poets, and writers have in the history of mankind always been in the avant-garde as far as understanding of human nature is concerned. So let me read to you about the connection between anger and melancholia, as depression was called, from Stendhal's, the charter house of Parma. <coughs> the mountain air, the majestic and tranquil aspect of this superb lake, which recalled to him that other, on the shores of which he has spent his childhood, all helped to transform into a tender depression Fabrizio's grief that was akin to anger. There is another characteristic of the depressed that should be mentioned here and that the therapist especially should keep in mind. And that is that the depressed will nearly always attempt to frustrate all attempts and efforts to help him. 
This is one of his methods of feeling superior to those he exploits and from whom he seeks help, because he can thereby prove how inadequate they really are, that they are really not sufficiently interested in him, that their help is really ineffective, to spur them on to more help. This characteristic has also its prototype already in childhood. It is seen in the child who after long crying and whining, when he is finally given for what he had cried, will say, now I don't want it. <laughs> so very often you will find in the adult depressed, after he's granted, which not being given him, he said, caused him to be depressed, he said, now it's too late. You probably have heard of childhood methods when one is already an adult that one uses and is generally referred to as regression. Now to the observer it may look like a regression, but in true ego psychology one has to look at it from the point of view of the patient. And there it looks different. It's no regression. Every human being does and can only do things with the utilization of his experiences and training that he had from childhood. His purpose with any movement and therefore with any neurosis is to achieve something that he is convinced is achieved best just in this way. He therefore strives forward to achieve something with the utilization of all his experiences from the past, his thinking, his feeling, his capabilities that he has trained. Now this active forward push with the utilization of all that he has learned, is now called regression by the instinct psychologists. At least we should know what they mean when they say that. It doesn't mean a regression. It means using, as one always has to do, one's experiences from the past and using it for that purpose. Now, since I so much stressed how the depressed creates and generates his depression, and that he does so for a purpose, namely in order to win over his opponent, to dominate him, not to be dominated according to how he sees his situation in life with other people, you may be under the impression that I want to convey to you the idea that the depressed likes his depression. He certainly is not going to give it up, but he does not like it. On the contrary, the depressed suffers very much from the depression and would love to be rid of it if, and there is a big if, if he could be sure he could maintain his idealized self-image, his significance, his dominant position, his domination over others also without depression. And nearly all depressed people don't believe they can succeed in doing that. Now depression is also in this respect a quite unique condition. The patient must really suffer in order to make his neurosis perform all the services for him. His suffering, the way he utilizes his suffering, makes his neurosis valid for him and makes of it a formidable weapon with which he battles his significant opponent, with which he accuses his opponent and his environment, with which he excuses himself from all obligations, with which he avoids all responsibilities, with which he certifies to his illness and his privileged position and that he must be aided and helped. And last not least, as I mentioned before, with which he depreciates those who try to help him so that he will appear in the center of the stage as a better and a nobler person. Now since his suffering is his main weapon of attack and defense, he cannot possibly forego it even if he wanted to. But we do encounter occasionally when we treat the depressed sly and underhanded smiles when the report of the sacrifices that others had to make for him on his behalf, on account of their illness. Now these smiles of satisfaction 
are often seen even in those depressed who complain most loudly in their self-accusatory fashion that they are such a burden to their opponent who has to make the sacrifices. And as I mentioned before, artists and writers have understood human nature long before and better than psychologists have. And Nestroy, who was a Viennese comedy writer at the turn of the 18th century, has one of his characters in a play act as a melancholic, a depressed. And he has him say in one of his plays, if I could not annoy people with my melancholia, I wouldn't enjoy it at all. Now, the depressed personality is not necessarily always depressed. And when they are not depressed, they may chase after glory that is easily achieved. And they can be the life of the party. But when failure threatens, they quickly withdraw into their depression, are inconsolable, and frequently blame someone near them or an unlucky star under which they were born for their plight. Some others, however, are always depressed. Amongst those who are only at times depressed, there are, for instance, those women who are depressed, and they state so themselves, just before their menstrual periods. Now, that endocrine changes occur before menstruation in all women, there is no question. We know that. But not all women in whom such endocrine changes occur dep become depressed. And many women who used to become depressed before menstruation do not become so anymore after successful psychotherapy. The most frequent cause for their depression before menstruation as revealed by many cases of psychotherapy was that these endocrine changes in their body, which they felt, were for them harbingers, reminders of their status as women, which they resented and did not want to accept. After they, they understood better than to be, that to be a woman does not mean that they are inferior, they did not become depressed anymore before menstruation. Again, it was an impotent rage about their fate of being a woman, which they resented deeply, but felt they had no right to resent and were impotent to do anything about, that caused their depression. Again, with women's lib raising the self-esteem of women, depression before menstruation can be expected to become a less and less frequent affliction. <coughs> A very important chapter in the treatment of the depressed patient is the handling of the pessimistic anticipations in which these patients ruminate, and which are the only way depression can be perpetuated in a patient if he did not concentrate intensively on the dire fate that is in store for him, if he did not mobilize his memory and all his facilities of thought and of feeling to create associations which will surely remind him of evil and calamitous things that did happen or that he read about, he could not maintain his depression. In the course of treatment, the patient must be convinced, he must be clearly shown that he is the one who produces his thoughts and feeling in himself. I might ask a patient, where do you think these thoughts come from? The patient usually says, I don't know. Then I say, they don't fall from heaven into your brain, do they? The patient usually says, no. And I say, nobody can put them into the brain, can they? Now, unless the patient is also very paranoid, in which case I don't pose such questions. <laughs> he, he again says, no. So I say, so you must be manufacturing these thoughts and feeling all by yourself, don't you? Patient will say, I guess so. And then they come with a clincher and say, I know how much you hate these bleak thoughts and painful feelings, how much you suffer from them. 
if you nevertheless constantly produce them within yourself, you must have a powerful and overriding reason for doing so. I also know you don't know how you make them or why you make them, but this is precisely what we are here together to find out and work out, so that you can become the master instead of they being your master. These thoughts and feelings dominating you, so that you can dominate and be in charge of your feelings and thinking. Now there's a curious double action in this stratagem that I use. First, I burden them with a responsibility for manufacturing these thoughts and feelings themselves. Then I relieve them of any blame for making them by telling them, I know, they don't know how they make it or why they make it. And especially by telling them that they have developed a pattern of making them from early childhood on, since they were babies, really. And Babies, after all, cannot be held responsible for any mistakes in their judgment or for any misunderstanding, on the basis of which these faulty patterns were formed by them. In addition, telling them that they are dominated by these thoughts and feelings may rouse their antagonism against these thoughts and feelings, and telling them that we will work so that they can dominate them because depressed people don't want to be dominated by anything or anybody, that may induce them to cooperate with me better in treatment. I also constantly stress to the depressed patient that we must work together and that I need his help, and that without his help, I am totally helpless. I cannot do anything. This is a very startling statement to a depressed patient, because he's so used to always demand and expect help from others, all others. And here, I, his doctor, his therapist, I'm asking him for help, even telling him that out, without his help, I am helpless. I am impotent without his help. Now, this stratagem, again, does two things. First, it diminishes or makes impossible that the patient shifts all the responsibility for failure or success of therapy onto the therapist. The patient is part of a team that works for the cure of the patient. It also opens the way for the patient to learn cooperation, an activity the patient never learned and always has shunned, because in cooperation you can't dominate which appeared to him always the only way to assure his significance, if he can dominate. Second, however, this inclusion of the patient into the treatment process gives the patient a feeling of his importance. It is apt to increase his self-esteem as a partner of the therapist. There's another thing that such therapy in such a way accomplishes. The depressed is used to stand with his back crouched, ready for battle. He is very competitive and is used to have to defend himself against being dominated or to battle to be able to dominate. Here, he does not have to battle. I told him I'm impotent without his help. So I'm no threat to him that I will dominate him. I told him I need his help. So he's already in a dominating position. He has already won. No need to battle anymore. What a relief. He can finally relax. All his life he has battled with an opponent for who is the stronger, who is on top. How can he humiliate him? How can he avoid being humiliated by him? How can he manage to look bigger? No opponent of his has ever told him that he has already won that he has rendered him impotent. Very often, therefore, patients will tell me that it is only here in my office that they are not depressed. And they ask me why that is. They say, in my office is the only place where they feel really relaxed. That is because they do not have to be on guard against being humiliated. 
They do not have to battle for dominance. They do not have to put on any airs to be esteemed. They know they are esteemed by me, not the action. I have told them I need and want them as partner. But they, as human beings, are esteemed. By declaring my need for their help, I have put myself on their level as an equal, as a partner, an equal partner. And they know that, and they feel that, despite the fact that it was I, and as a rule only I, who has told them how shabby their methods are, how devious, how malevolent, how deceitful, how phony. You would be surprised. They are never offended. <laughs> they know that I esteem them as people, and that I consider their method as something they have unconsciously adopted as children already, in answer to situations and conditions surrounding them, without being aware of most of what they are doing that they have developed this pattern, this style of life, in answer to threats of what they thought would be their total annihilation. That they thought they had to dominate because they were convinced they would be dominated otherwise by others. And that would prove that they are nobodies. That they felt they had to depreciate others, lest they would appear small and insignificant. And that would be the greatest calamity and mean total collapse of their idealized self-image. Actually, they never trusted themselves to be able to do anything by themselves and for themselves without the help of others, except perhaps the exploitation of others, which, with their weakness and helplessness, they trained to demand and get help from others. They firmly believed they would be absolutely nobody, akin to dust, if they tried to cooperate with somebody on an equal footing, footing as equals. And they would be abandoned by everybody if they showed more independence and said they don't need so much help. Independence of action. Thus, seeing only inferiors and superiors in people they meet, never equals. You can imagine and visualize the tremendous tension that they are under constantly. And there, they meet their therapist. Somebody they were convinced was superior to them and whom they therefore had to impress with their personality and to battle in order not to appear as not nothing. And he tells them, he is impotent without their help. He offers friendship and cooperation as an equal, equal to them, not superior to them. Can you imagine what a relief that is? Can you also see how wrong it would be to face, to in, how wrong it would be on the face of that to put such a patient on a couch? He in the lower position, the therapist sitting lord-like over him. There can be no equality, and there must be a feeling of the therapist being the master and he the inferior. This is a position no depressed can stand without starting a battle. In the therapy, I have outlined here they can learn to cooperate and live as equals with other people. They can learn to develop some greater self-esteem and some greater independence and to abandon the passive-aggressive methods, the use of weakness and sickness and helplessness as their safeguarding device, as their defense mechanism. All these things cannot be told the patient right in the beginning of treatment. It depends very much on the personality of the patient, on his additional neurotic traits in addition to his depression, on his readiness to cooperate at that time, and his readiness for insight at that time. 
Many things have to be delayed for a long time, therefore, and one has to play that very much by ear. Due to his need to battle and to prove himself self-determined, the depressed is also very negativistic. And I expect him to be trying to thwart and frustrate my efforts to help him. He therefore can be expected to do very op often the opposite of what he feels he's expected to do. I sometimes have to give him a chance to be negativistic and prove me wrong. I also always try to undermine or to minimize his sabotage of the therapy by not expecting anything from him. The depressed may often get quite agitated because he's used to always be told what to do since he has made himself so dependent, so helpless, and then proving that the advice that was given was wrong or bad or that what, what was advised did not work. He does not know quite what to do when I do not advise him. He may, for instance, ask, do you think I should go out and visit so and so? He has been lying around the house for two months and never visited anybody. So I say, ah, I'm not sure you are quite as yet ready for that. <laughs> you can be sure he will go out and visit that person tomorrow. And he will report to me it went quite well. This will show, of course, that he has at least partially substituted me for his main opponent. On the other hand, if he remains totally fixed on his original significant opponent in the family, I sometimes have to interfere with the family if this is feasible and tell them not to demand anything, ask anything or expect anything from the patient. Or I tell at least the patient to tell his family that it is a therapist's order that he should do only what he wants to do that nobody should urge him or even ask him to do anything. Can you imagine a more ideal situation the person can have when he can do what he wants and nobody can expect or should ask him anything? Now eventually, nearer the end of treatment than the beginning, there comes the time when one must tell the patient that once we have found out in our work together why he produces a black mood so constantly, it will be his responsible responsibility if he continues to make it. And then I tell them, and therefore I think, you will really fight hard to prevent that we find it out. You may even sabotage our cooperation so we will not find out together because responsibility for your moods may still loom to you as too threatening a thing to you, especially since you have all your life to be, been able to hide so neatly behind not being responsible. Again, I count on their negativism and the desire to prove me wrong, and if they do, that's only the, the better. Eventually, there comes also the time when I can tell them, now let's look at it the other way around. What would happen if instead of constantly conjuring up pessimistic anticipations and perspectives, you would constantly conjure up optimistic perspectives and anticipations? How rosy everything will be, how everything is going to improve, and how your life is getting better and easier all the time. And then I show them, or him, that if he did that, instead of doing what he's actually doing, namely the pessimistic anticipations, he would have full responsibility for his success or failure in his life. And he is mortally afraid of that, because he's sure it will be a failure. That he would have to cease dominating everybody and start cooperating with them, of which he is again mortally afraid because he's convinced that only by maintaining his dominant 
prominent position can he maintain his prestige, his status, his significance? And then I tell him, you know, you better stick conjuring up pessimistic predictions and anticipations because I'm sure you still feel you cannot survive in a world where you are equals with others and not on top of them. You better stick to your depression, at least for a while, until you are convinced yourself that cooperation and equality will not kill you. And that on the contrary, it will finally make a mensch out of you, a real human being. And again, they are never offended when I say that. They know they have not been decent to others, that they have exploited them shamelessly, that they have made a special point of separating themselves out from others by insisting on being special, dominant, and superior. But actually, in their desperate attempt at compensation for the deep-seated feeling of being below everybody. They also know, however, by this time in therapy, what an arduous, futile, and wasteful and tiring effort it has always been to uphold that fiction. I think the distortion of logic in the service of depression is best brought out by the case of a woman who said to me after some, some time of being in treatment, you know, I could give up my depression any time I would want to. So I asked her, why don't you do it then? She said, I cannot afford to do it. I said, why? My husband used to treat me like a doormat before I became depressed. Now with my depression, I have the upper hand and he has to do as I want him to. If I give up my depression, I'm sure he will treat me again like a doormat and I couldn't stand that anymore. Now, so far, this is at least fairly logical, although certainly we could find better ways to deal with such a problem. But now comes what characterizes a depressive neurosis. I asked her, and what I said, said made logical sense to me. I said, why then don't you just play act to your husband for your husband's benefit, whom you want to impress that you are depressed? that you're still very depressed, but the rest of the day when he's at work, you feel fine and enjoy yourself. <laughs> you should have seen the indignant expression on her face when she said, oh, I could not be that dishonest. <laughs> So you see, she really must suffer. She must really suffer in order to feel justified to dominate and to exploit. Her idealized self-image does not permit her to be responsible for these actions to other people, to exp their exploitation. She must not be responsible, which she arranges by being sick and depressed. Then she is permitted to exploit, to dominate, because she can ask for help, to be ornery and negativistic, to depreciate others, to frustrate them, and she can use such distortion of logic, despite the fact that she was also the one who bemoaned the fact that she was being such a burden to her poor husband. She was not able to see the dishonesty in that. As Adlerians, you know, or Adlerians know, that man strives always relentlessly towards his idealized goal of mastery, of conquering obstacles of all sorts, on his way towards his goal of being a somebody and not a nobody. With this goal of superiority, there is also contained his idealized self-image. And in this idealized self-image is contained his feeling, his thought about his personal value, his own significance. Any threat to the collapse of this goal and self-image that may loom is felt as being most catastrophic. 
a devastating calamity that must be prevented at all cost. The self-image must be upheld. It no, normally is a threat to the self-image does not threaten normal people who feel secure amongst their fellow men, whose interest in others gives them a feeling they are not alone in the world against the rest, but belong with people. I'm speaking, you know, the people who have managed to live by the maxim that their private interests must run parallel or be in harmony with the interest of humanity in general. But those lacking this social feeling for others, this feeling of belonging, of solidarity with people, will of necessity have to devise what we know as neurotic symptoms in order to safeguard their personality ideal, their sense of validity, of importance, which they will feel is threatened. Depression, as we said, is one of these symptoms. They will experience increasingly all people as threats to the security of their idealized self-image, because they will fear that people will discover that they are not so wonderful, not so perfect as they insist people must consider them, in compensation for the actual feeling of inadequacy. Every encounter with another person becomes then a source of great tension and painful self-consciousness with a need to play act for those people if they cannot avoid them altogether. What the depressed, in essence, is saying is approximately this. I can f only feel secure. I can only feel that my self-image is safe if I can prove myself superior to everyone, if I can dominate everybody and not be dominated by anybody. So often, therefore, we will find these depressed people associating only with two kinds of people. Those they consider definitely inferior to them, whom they exploit and find maybe boring, and where they can safely dominate without being challenged. And those they consider definitely far superior to them, by whom they desire to be accepted and whom they try to dominate and exploit by demonstrating their weakness and helplessness to them. They envy those fiercely and really hate them. It is quite startling to them when they are confronted with the fact that in their world they recognize only superiors and inferiors, but never an equal. For this reason also, they can never be a real friend to anyone. They hate people who have disdain for them because they see them as objects they have to conquer because otherwise those people may show them up for the sham that they think themselves that they really are. I spoke also before of the fact that the battle for dominance is ruled usually, is center, centered usually against one main significant opponent, and I spoke of the rage, the anger, and fury, the hostility of the depressed, and that they really don't feel justified to be so angry, but people would not approve if their anger is shown. And because anger and fury might not be accepted by people, they would lose their sympathy and their help and because that they need to present themselves as specially noble, well-meaning, and tender-hearted, which is one of the modes of feeling superior to others. Now, before I go into the phenomenon of suicide, which I only want to do after we have a question and answer period, and we have gone for lunch, I want to say a short word about the psychotic phase of depression. When somebody has a psychotic depression, which happens often, what really happens there is that their goal of superiority of the depressed, his idealized self-image, was threatened with total collapse 
in such a way or to such an extent that it appeared to the patient impossible that he will be able to safeguard the self-image within the boundaries of reality. This can happen easily in people who in their childhood already have trained themselves and are therefore prone to escape from reality whenever anything hap appears to be difficult and too threatening to them. There are those who usually are classified as schizoid or schizoaffective and so on. But it can also happen occasionally to those who are not basically schizoid, but who have gradually reduced and eventually lost their footing or their roots in social relations. For instance, those whose only social reality was within the narrow circle of their family. And the loss of it will then loosen their last foothold on social reality with their mates and or their children, and in consequence, with reality, because that was the only reality they knew. It may threaten them with the loss of their only significance they ever knew, and they may lose their sense of self-worth entirely. Spurious as it may have been all along in the past decades, it was evidently sufficient to give them a feeling of their social significance and value with a feeling of being needed. With their children now marrying, moving away, and perhaps not really caring as much as they would want them to care, their last hold on reality may collapse. These are also the so-called menopausal depressions. They occur also in men, understandably, but not so frequently. <coughs> the endocrine changes in the menopause in themselves do not cause the depression, but only make them feel that they are also physically now not well, not well put together, and they may feel this an additional blow to their ego also that their productive period is over and so on. Now all women, women go through these endocrine changes, but as is known, not all women suffer from depression in that period and age. It is a loss of feeling significant, of being needed, that brings on rage at their children who deserted them and therefore the depression. Now here belongs also in this group and also, if you see that why it is rarer in men is because men, most men derive their, a great part of their significance from their job, while many women derive a great part of their significance by being mothers. And when that goes, then their self-esteem may go. Here belong also the very narcissistic people whose main claim, main claim to fame and significance have been their looks. These will also easily fall into a psychotic depression when their looks threaten to go forever. They may be angry at fate or angry at those who do not cater to them anymore the way they were used to when they were still beautiful. The childhood forerunners of these psychotic depressions are in those children who are crybabies or habitual pouters and mopers and so on, in addition to having been excessive daydreamers or had an extremely narrow social sphere centered only in their, on their mother and family and those who were very vain so that the superficial appearance is the most important thing in the world to them. It should be noted that if these children had not also been crybabies or habitual pouters and mopers, one should think that this is probably a schizophrenic mechanism in the main and not a depression, although it looks with its hopelessness like a depression. Of course, as I mentioned before, there is very often a combination of both. Now, to be or become depressed, you must have trained yourself in using weakness, 
sickness, helplessness as a weapon for control and domination of others, for getting you away, and that while you make it appear a suffering passive condition, it is filled with rage and anger, and that you really, while appearing to blame yourself, are blaming others for your plight, makes them responsible for it, exploits them, and depreciates them to boot by proving that they cannot help you. Now, all that, however, does not as yet add up to make a person suicidal. <coughs> I think we should start an answer and question and answer period so that I can go into suicide after lunch. Who monitors or starts out with question and answers? I have to give the answers, but you are the one who gives the questions. I don't see it or hear. Yes. I can't hear. No. You don't have a speaker like I do. <laughs> Maybe you come front. She's puzzled by your differentiation between the depressed person and the schizoid person, the schizoid diagnosis. She, she isn't clear what the difference is between the depressed, neurotic depressant and the schizoid. Yes, I think this is very important to differentiate. Hopelessness is not necessarily depression. A schizophrenic can be, or a schizoid person can be hopeless as to his future. He does not need to dominate anybody. He is not afraid to be dominated. He has shut out the world so much that it doesn't even touch him. People can yell their head off. He doesn't even answer them. Or he makes up, a, a, in, the, as in the paranoid schizophrenic very often, a world of its, his own and lives in that and doesn't even react to the world. That's not depressed. The depressed reacts very much to the world, even though he may not show it. But he reacts very much to the world. That's number one. The schizophrenic and schizoid does not have one main opponent with, which he battle, with whom he battles. He accuses the world, the system, the stars, the universe, the cosmos, the heavens, women, men, the police, the FBI, but not an individual with whom he battles. That is a very great differentiation. The depressed has his battle with one main opponent which he sometimes substitutes with others, but it's still one main opponent he battles with. He battles with people. The schizophrenic doesn't battle with people. Anybody is all right with him to battle with if he battles. <laughs> he does not have to, he, he proves to himself mainly in his, because he has shut out the outside world, his inner life is much richer and he lives to himself. He does not have to prove his significance to others. He proves it to himself, and that is usually enough. That's a big difference between schizophrenics and hopelessness in the schizophrenic who doesn't see any future for the world, for himself, for anything. The depressed has pessimistic anticipation. He sees the future. He sees everything will go wrong, but in a in a way that can be logical, more logical. The schizophrenic is also very often much more illogical. And suicides in schizophrenics as compared to the depressives are very, very different. A schizophrenic may fancy himself of being an angel with wings and therefore jump out from the 22nd floor and, and, and uh, 
wipe his wings and, and think he can fly, and this may be a suicide. It's not suicide, he made a mistake in the thinking. <laughs> the depressed has a significant opponent against whom he wants to commit suicide, on whom he wants to take revenge, uh, coming into to that art. But there is enormous difference. Yes? Every day in living situation, not in a therapy situation, what do you think is the best way to deal with a depressed person? I think you have to put yourself on his level, show him that you are an equal, show him that he doesn't need to dominate because he can his, get his way if, as long as it's halfway reasonable in any other way too. And to praise him and be supportive for all the things that he, everybody does, do some things for himself independently and be appreciative of that and to be not very attentive when he uses his antics, his exploitation of others. He says, all oh, right, sometimes he will do it, sometimes he won't. He's like everybody else, and you are like everybody else, and so on. I think this is the best way people can act and deal unless they can get the person into therapy with somebody who can treat depression, which is unfortunately not very frequent. Yes. Why would, how, how can you uh, <coughs> work? Yes. Uh, very obviously, this is a person, and there are so unfortunately so many of them, who lose their sense of significance when they are retired, or when they, usually when they are retired and don't have a function anymore, the men especially, uh, don't have a function anymore. And it, I think it is a shame in our society, and as I understand that Congress now passed, uh, not a bill yet, but a, a bill will be passed to abolish uh, retirement, at the forced retirement at 65, which is very good. Uh, because these people can be extremely helpful. They have, be, they, they have experiences of ages that the young people don't have and can be consultants and helpers to the younger people and should be used that way so that their significance is also remaining and, and is saved. And they are really also of real, of real help. Uh, and this is uh, how they can be helped is only by giving them something really worthwhile to do, not make-believe things, but uh, things that have real value and show them that they can do it, that they can be of help, that they can be important and significant. This is the only reason why they are depressed and this is also how to treat them if it can be managed and very often it is very difficult to find something for a person like that. I don't hear you. I don't hear you. If you're dealing with somebody that's a chronic alcoholic and is depressed, can you uh, deal with that depression without dealing with the alcohol? It's not possible. That is not possible. If somebody is alcoholic, because as long and as soon as he has alcohol in him, you cannot reason with them. It's not possible. And it's absolutely futile to reason with somebody who is drunk to try to reason with him. It's absolutely futile. You have to wait until he's sober, if he's sober, or he has to be detoxified before you can do anything. In Alcoholics Anonymous, they also have to first be off the drinks, and then they are being treated. You should get them into Alcoholics Anonymous if you have no other place to treat them. I understand here at the Alfred Adler Center of Minnesota, they have some people who treat very much the chemically 
addicted people, alcoholics as well as drug addicts. Yes. Is what? You had indicated, I believe, that ability to love was a precondition for depression. No, on the contrary, I said that this is ridiculous to state. On the contrary, ability to love is very much diminished in the depressed. Yeah, uh, but does it make a person also depressed if his, if his ability to love is high and thwarted? Is high and thwarted. Well, then, then he shows that he cannot stand frustration. And why does he choose a one-sided love instead of a mutual one? <coughs> Maybe his demands are too great. And he's becoming depressed, you mean? Yes. Because of it? Right. Because the love is un unappreciated? Well, you have to find out why the love is unappreciated. Maybe he chooses somebody who is not equally in love with him as he is in love with that person. Why does he choose such impossible situations that can only end up in being hurt? That has nothing to do with depression. He may become depressed, but his depression is a condition that really makes him become the victim in order to prove how badly he is treated. Could you elaborate, because of the central part getting in touch with the anger and rage, could you elaborate on some possible techniques to get in touch with, with a lot of hidden anger and rage? Uh, yes, I could elaborate on it very much. I have even many case histories that are mainly designed uh, mobilizing entitlement to anger. <laughs> Denial of anger to parents, protection of them and its resolve. Now, the, the, let, you, let me tell you of a case. This is only a case to demonstrate how protective patients are of their parents, or rather of themselves in their feelings of anger towards their parents, how quickly the changes in treatment. As this is a 21-year-old girl, single, just graduated from college. She tried modeling, wanted to be, get on TV singing. She had undergone three years of analysis with her psychiatrist. A woman suggested that she try someone else. She had studied music and art, played the piano by ear, has composed a lot, has directed musical comedy at Syracuse University, and so on. She's 21, she has a brother of 18, and says of him he's a stable person, and he thinks that we are very close. He thinks. Her father is a lawyer, and both parents are wonderful to me. I, however, do not live up to their expectations. Her chief complaint is, that she's a compulsive eater. Now, the eat, compulsive eating is already a sign of depression nearly always. She has gained 15 pounds in the past two weeks. She had lost 30 pounds in the past two months because she wanted to give her parents a graduation present. <laughs> she now weighs 128 pounds, and she had been, had been up to 180. The patient said, that is quite a problem to my parents. If you only knew what they have to go through all their life about my overweight. The parents, not she. 